So thank you so much, Mr. Vivek and the panel for the in-depth knowledge session on scaling fast social entrepreneurship in India. Well, coming up next is a fireside chat where we will see a serial entrepreneur who is a part of umpteen businesses and social organization. He exudes passion in angel investing, leadership and mentoring. None other than the president of Thai Global, Mr. Mahavir Sharma. And joining him in conversation is American journalist, best-selling author, award-winning award entrepreneur and speaker. His books, articles and speeches often focuses on the fundamentals of business, the need for constant innovation and the importance of building the right corporate culture. He is the current advisor at Forbes School of Business and Technology. He is a futurist with a unique vantage point on the trends driving business and economic climate. Mr. Carl, Mr. Rich Kalgard. Welcome, sir. Welcome, Mr. Mahavir. Thank you, Akriti. And uh, good morning, Rich. Uh, from, uh, you, I know you're in Silicon Valley. We're in India late evening here. Uh, but we've had great sessions and I'm, everyone's looking forward to your session. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen, this session will be broken into two parts. I've requested Rich to share his insights on where technology-driven uh, organizations will be going um, in the year 2021 to 2024, uh, based upon his um, insights, inside information, and knowledge and understanding of the domains that he um, you know, expresses or he represents. So Rich, over to you uh, for a keynote on where do you see technology-based startups and founders and CEOs going in the year 21 to 24. Well, thank you so very much. Uh, let me just uh, uh, load the slide deck here and I'll run through this as fast as I can. I've got to share the slides first. Let's see. I hope he has share option, please. Yep, there we go. All right. We can see it, Rich, good. Oh, good. Well, I'm gonna run through these very fast. I do what I, I speak a style that I call rapid PowerPoint. And so if any of you want the deck, just let Ty Khan know and I'll, I'll funnel it to you through Ty Khan. But I wanna talk about the next three years and I'll talk about some business trends that I've been able to observe here, both as a uh, journalist working for Forbes, which is New York based. We have a big office in Singapore, Forbes Asia, but also my domicile in Silicon Valley where I'm able to see things that I think maybe others don't, um, or at least the rest of the world. People in Silicon Valley certainly do. But uh, number one is that digital first strategies are continuing to accelerate. Uh, this has been a, a trend that's 55 years or so in the making ever since um, people at Fairchild Semiconductor and Texas Instruments put a transistor into two dimensions on a printed circuit. Um, We've come to know Moore's law. We all know what Moore's law means in terms of transistor density, but the economic consequence of Moore's law is that for these 50 plus years, we've had a 30% annual improvement in digital bang for the buck is the root level of technology evolution. And it's led to all these uh, digital miracles that we have today. And it's disrupted over the last 20 years, a lot of these industries. These industries up on the screen here have been profoundly transformed. Now what's happening is that there's a new engine of disruption. People are trying to come up with the name of it. I call it Wong's Law after Jensen Wong, uh, the founder and CEO of NVIDIA. But numerous CEOs and CTOs are telling me that they believe the root level of technology innovation and evolution is jumped the tracks and is now moving at about two times as fast. Think about that. Think about an annual rate of improvement in the underlying capabilities per dollar spent of 60% per year, and think about how rapidly that compounds. Scott Guthrie, who's the CEO of uh, Microsoft Azure, or the head of Microsoft Azure, reports to Satya Nadella, digital technology is evolving much faster now. The cloud not only scales up, it scales out to users. Um, Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of VMware, the cloud wars have barely started. You'll soon have unlimited compute and unlimited data, which you can harvest at scale. And so this new engine, uh, what's propelling this faster rate of evolution is really the confluence of different things. In the semiconductor world, it's CPUs and GPUs. It's cloud computing, edge computing, uh, 5G is just hitting, and um, 
the net of it is, is that we're moving to a world where we have a giant global supercomputer with near instant trend analysis of all KPIs and the ability to significantly improve upon them. Uh, it's the world that Mark Andreessen predicted in 2011 when he said software is eating the world. And now what's going to happen over the next 10 years is all other industries that haven't been particularly transformed are in the process of being transformed, profoundly transformed over the next 10 years. Business trend number two, extreme valuation differences create asymmetric warfare. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I'll uh, go to Peter Thiel, um, the co-founder of PayPal, the founder of Palantir on Facebook's board. He said the American economy, if this applies to the global economy too, is in a strange place. There's too much funding for bits companies and not enough for Adams companies. And what he means by bits companies are companies in uh, where the product is denominated on a screen. So it would be software, it would be entertainment, um, and uh, capital is flowing into those industries. A great example of this is comparing Tesla with Toyota. Toyota is the largest automobile manufacturer in the world by revenue. You get a difference in the size of scale in terms of revenue. You get a difference in the size of scale in terms of profit. But now look at the market value of Tesla uh, versus Toyota. And these figures are from today, December 8th in the United States. Um, look at the size difference there. It's because Tesla represents not an automobile company, but a platform company. And people who are valuing it as an automobile company are failing to see the platform that Tesla is building an autonomous driving, artificial intelligence, um, batteries, and, and a whole range of products under that platform. So that's the, another, great, another great example is the world's largest companies by market cap. Again, today's valuations, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, and Facebook. They're all, um, they're all software companies to one degree or another. Apple makes some hardware, of course, but the valuation, you know, where is Berkshire Hathaway? Where is Exxon? Where are the companies that usually fill a list like this? So this asymmetric funding leads to repeated assaults on profit models of legacy companies, which can't get the funding to conduct multiple defenses. Asymmetric warfare. Trend number three is all industries will be reshaped by digital acceleration. Um, this is a global IT market size um, by uh, none other than Satya Nadella, his prediction on his last uh, Microsoft earnings call, where he said in 2020, the global uh, IT market is 5% of the global GDP. Well, do the calculation, gl global GDP in US dollars is 80 trillion. So 5% of that is 4 trillion. He said that he thought it would go to 10% by 2030, but hold the phone here because by 2030, once we're past COVID and we resume normal global growth that we've seen over the past 230 years of around three and a half percent, we will be a $120 trillion economy. So 10% of $120 trillion economy is $12 trillion. So over the next decade, I, the IT market triples in size. And here's just one example of the knockoff effects, the things that people don't immediately consider when they think about that. The big boom in construction. Uh, we're gonna have to have a huge boom to accompany this uh, global growth in IT in data centers, distribution centers, semiconductor plants, automated factories, and the one that everybody forgets about, which is electricity generation. These are gonna to have to be huge areas going forward. Next trend, speed and adaptability become existentially important. Mickey Drexler, who I have up on my slide here, uh, was the uh, retired from the retail industry in the United States in 2017. He was legendary for being this great CEO of a retail outlet called The Gap. Uh, then he moved over and he transformed another retail outlet called J. Crew. And he said on his retirement in 2017, despite the fact that he had accomplished so very much in the retail industry, he knew it was coming down the pike. He said, I underestimated how fast technology would upend things. I wish I could go back 10 years knowing what I know now. And that's the thing I caution CEOs who aren't directly in the software industry to step back and say, are, are you going to regret, uh, have regrets about uh, underestimating the speed of change over a 10 year period as Mickey Drexler admitted to? Um, you see it in sort of the decline and fall of uh, once great companies. General Electric is measured by 
its stock price. It's, it's a husk of what it used to be. And the irony here is that General Electric really had an early grasp on the power of Internet of Things, but it failed to execute because it was too big and it was too bureaucratic and smaller companies that were pure plays ran circle around it. Um, if you haven't seen the need for speed, it's only because you haven't woken up yet. That's Bill McDermott, CEO of ServiceNow. McDermott told me that in June. McDermott used to be the global CEO of SAP. Um, under ServiceNow, the market value since he's been CEO for about 15 months has, um, has tripled. A great, uh, one of those great CEOs from whom you get insights. One of the amazing things is that despite the COVID slowing down the economy in general, is the what's happening in the information economy. And you see, you know, Satya Nadella said, we've seen uh, five years of disruption and innovation and progression in the IT world in the space of six months because of COVID. A lot of people didn't see that one coming, including me at first. I thought companies would just sit on their cash and slow down spending and sit out the recession. But what's happened is that IT companies that are able to um, prove a very rapid return on investment, weeks or small number of months, are finding that companies are buying their products even during a recession. So that's been one of the upside surprises of this year. And I think you see it reflected in, in the value of technology companies in, in global stock markets. You know, even oil companies now realize that, uh, that uh, oil isn't the only commodity out there that that has value, the data is the rising commodity value in the world. Uh, this is a cartoon from the New Yorker, two dinosaurs. Uh, all I'm saying is now is the time to develop technology to deflect an asteroid. And that sort of gets at the urgency of having to move, uh, and having to move fast. Next trend, this is something that's a little bit off the grid. It's not that quantifiable, but, but I've been able to observe it in many conversations, particularly over the last six months the decline of what I would call the jerk CEO and the rise of the empathetic leader. Now, there was a time, at least in the United States, where we kind of winked and nod and celebrated the jerk CEOs, the, the CEOs who were, in some cases, brilliant and, and, a, and a very, on a very basic basis, ethical too. I think that applied to Steve Jobs on the upper left, uh, Steve Ballmer on the upper right, the other ones, not so much, but all of these characters, whether they were building ethical companies or whether they were perpetrating frauds, were known for being really hard on people. And I think, I think that trend was on the way out prior to COVID because of new tools of transparency like Glassdoor and other, uh, other websites where you can rank companies and rank CEOs, thus throwing, you know, opening the windows and the doors to fresh air. But now in COVID, it's really accelerated. You now, there's an example of another jerk CEO, uh, Travis Kalanick of, of Uber, built a great company, but eventually his, his, um, his behavior got him ousted. Today, you're seeing the rise of empathetic CEOs. I think that was happening because of Glassdoor, but it's really accelerated in this age of COVID because CEOs know today they have to hold their company cultures together in a very difficult time. And they don't have the means of walking around the office and patting people on the back. They don't have the means of having industry conferences. Mostly how they do this is through Zoom and other mediums like that. And they really have to emote this idea that we, you know, we stand for good in the world and I care about you as individuals. And so COVID has not only accelerated five years of innovation in IT technology, it's also accelerated, I think, this rise of the empathetic leader. Um, you know, Eric Wan of Zoom, who I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, a couple of months ago for the Thai Khan Global Conference. Uh, our strategy is happiness, our value is care. And I think he sums it up perfectly. Another trend, growing talent and building teams will be radically and reinvented. COVID has accelerated that, but it was in the making all along. And you see, you know, I talked about GE being, you know, among the first to see the potential of internet of things, but being too slow to capitalize on it. Why? Because they're big and bureaucratic, too many layers of management, um, almost like a quasi government. And so you see small and autonomous beats big and rules based teams every time. I realize in some industries, you're gonna have to have 
rule, you know, if you're in the financial services, they're more governed by, by rules than other industries. But generally speaking, small and autonomous and fast moving beats big and rules based every time. Amazon Web Services came out of a project with about 12 people um, and has grown into be a, a $35 billion revenue component of, of Amazon today. Or you take Atlassian, the Sydney, Australia company. They have 84% gross margins because they have a high trust culture. And to the degree you've built a high trust culture, it means you, uh, you know, the inverse is that you get a low bureaucratic overhead. Bureaucratic overheads exist when you lack trust and you have to be rules-based. So if you can create this empathetic, accountable, high trust culture, you can reduce your bureaucratic overhead and you're, you become much more efficient as a result. And Atlassian has done a great job of that. The second thing about teams is a cognitive diversity is a force multiplier. An example is Starbucks back in the days of their fast global growth. Howard Schultz on the right is the one you know, um, the founder and CEO, but his number two from 1994 to 2007 was a guy also named Howard, Howard Bihai, Bihar, and Howard Bihar and Howard Schultz were the opposite as thinkers. Schultz is very competitive and analytical, and Bihar is very, a very uh, empathetic and um, and and emotional. Uh, admits that he's emotional. So how you get this cognitive diversity is when Starbucks would reach a you know hit a flat spot, they wouldn't meet goal for some city and region where they'd set a goal and they were short of goal at the end of the quarter. Schultz was always convinced the answer was in the numbers. And Bihar said, let me go out and talk to store managers. And you see the numbers and the input from store managers and how they were feeling gave you the 360 view. Or you look at Fred uh, Smith, who, the founder of FedEx and still its CEO today. Um, when the world was going through a transition from mainframe computers to network computers, he knew that on, on his board of directors, he needed somebody that was really smart about network computing. So he sent a CIO out into Silicon Valley who brought back a woman named Judy Estrin, who was uh, a student of Vint Cerf. Vint Cerf is known as the father of TCPIP, and she was a student of his at, at UCLA. And she was a, uh, an entrepreneur herself, and she started a company, eventually sold to Cisco. But this is somebody who he would have never had on his, it wouldn't have occurred to him to have had a person like Judy Estrin, who is the opposite of Fred Smith in every way, including gender. Um, but, but the need created the need for diversity and, it, and it, it's a wonderful example of cognitive diversity yields so much. Um, smart leaders are gonna look for non-obvious talent. The world is competing for obvious talent. By obvious talent, I mean, you know, this is a slide I showed earlier, the world's uh, largest companies by market cap. Uh, every one of those companies, at least one of the co-founders scored 800 on their math SAT test. Well, that's led to this belief that to be a you know, competitive technology company, you have to be filled with you know, what we like to call in Silicon Valley rocket scientists or natively gifted people in math, superstars in math, 0.1 um, percenters in math. Well, there aren't that many of them is the problem. And if that's who you want to populate your company with, you're going to pay for them. The median pay at Facebook is more than $240,000. Think about that, $240,000. Hardly any industry can compete with that. Now, this is a trick slide. It shows my bias for American sports, but if you can name any one of these people, congratulations, you win the prize. They have something in common. They were all picked ahead of Tom Brady in the NFL draft in the year 2000. Tom Brady was a late bloomer. There he is in high school. And uh, I wrote this book that came out last year that CEOs, in addition to these superstars coming out of colleges like MIT and Harvard and the Indian Institutes of Technology and all of those, uh, you also have to have a way of finding the people who, are, who didn't show their excellence at age 17 or 18, but are the people who are going to grow and grow and grow. And this is what I wrote about in my book. And I'm coming to the last couple of slides here, and then we can get into the Q&A, Mahavir. So you can take a deep breath. I'm not going to run on uh, more than about a minute. But Jim Breyer, who is our uh, was our Forbes Venture Capitalist of the Year and made the cover in 2014 um, when he was uh, the leader of Accel, uh, a Silicon Valley venture capital firm, later went out uh, and started Briar Capital to focus exclusively on AI, uh, chiefly in the US and China and now increasingly 
uh, I hear in India. Um, and he said that this about uh, AI and wisdom and this idea that you've got to populate your team with cognitive diversity, early bloomers, late bloomers, people with different disciplines. He said AI is different uh, than software in this respect. Software, throw a bunch of computer scientists and data scientists into a room, um, and then they throw their project over the wall and you see if it has any business application. Teams today must be interdisciplinary and cognitively diverse from the start. I use the example of medical AI, um, where you have the computer scientists and the data scientists, but you also have um, radiologists, you know, there at the table creating the saw, radiologists with 30 years of experience. If you wanna use AI to you know, detect lung cancer um, earlier, you need both. Intelligence is not enough. What you want from AI is a higher order wisdom. The race will go to the wise, he says. And um, thank you for uh, allowing me to present. Well, no, this was this was incredible. Um, a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, back end research and conversations. Um, sorry, I had to. We had to make you rush through it because time was short, and we wanted to um, get some questions from me or from the audience. So first question um, that I have, you know, while I totally agree with whatever you have presented in terms of how times will change, I, I understand that energy and power sector is going, the price per unit is going to go down, it's going down, it's going to go further down. I think, uh, in my opinion, the world will be energy surplus pretty shortly with, with solar, wind, and new forms of energy coming in. Similarly, I feel tech with competition increasing with cloud computing, with data centers across the world, uh, with, with the uh, companies being intra-country, inter-country, uh, you know, the cost of data storage, the cost of con uh, conversations, the co cost of multiple things will come down. Do you think, uh, and as we grow in the consumer industry into Africa's and Latin America's and Asia's of the world with people who don't still are not using, um, you know, things around as much, do you think that, that being lean um, and no office space and the COVID uh, that has created a situation where you have to cut down on your costs and be lean, not only in terms of manpower and operations, but also in real estate, on travel, et cetera, is going to be the future going forward? I think that's a great question and it's one that a lot of uh, people are asking. And you get a variety of opinion here. Um, today in the United States, a company called C3.ai, Tom Siebel's company is going public. And, um, and uh, I, I've been a friend of Tom's for multiple decades and have worked a little bit uh, on his project at, at C3. And he's among those who believes that uh, you have to have people in a room. You have to have uh, software people and, you know, up in front of a whiteboard screaming at each other because you resolve problems. There are things you simply cannot do um, uh, in, uh, over a Zoom call. Although, you know, Eric Wan and, um, you know, Microsoft, the people at Microsoft Teams and, you know, WebEx, Cisco WebEx and others will tell you that, you know, this is going to become a much richer medium. And, um, and so don't judge it, uh, don't judge uh, what it's going to be capable of in 2025 by what it's uh, capable of doing in 2020. So I think it's, but I think it's, we're gonna arrive at some kind of a, a middle. I mean, <clears throat> going back, uh, I think there are certain teams that need a closer co collaboration. Uh, maybe a software team under a deadline is, fits that definition or anybody under, you know, you're launching a project and a big one and maybe, you know, that calls for more uh, in-person collaboration. But that's not how you exist all the time, number one. Number two, psychographically, I think if we're co competing for talent today, it's not only you want, you know, in cognitive diversity, you have people who are introverts and extroverts. And um, you have some people who thrive um, working at home and you have other people who are slowly fading away. Um, they're becoming less productive, they're overeating, they're anxious, they're depressed, whatever it is. And that probably hits harder on extroverts who, who gain energy when they're around people, as opposed to introverts who feel like th they don't mind being around people, just feel like they're giving up energy. I think you take any single human being and they're, they're, there's somebody who thrives being in the office five days a week, there's somebody four, three, two, one. And so I think, I think this is like a fascinating year, uh, 
topic for HR companies and maybe, you know, to think about, to think about how you would, who, who really thrives um, in the office all the time and who doesn't and what is the mix. So I think, um, I think unless you take that component into it, um, then you don't have a, you don't have a clear answer other to say that it'll be, it, we're not going back to what we were totally, but I don't think we'll be in this work from home period forever either. Or sure. Okay, so on technology and my last question for the evening, um, I can see lots of wearable devices um, taking over um, handheld devices or desktops or laptops, um, you know, whether it's on your um, glasses or it's embedded in your arm or wrist or mine or whatever it is with, with AI and ML capabilities. Do you see um, digitization to that extent um, or you think that's far away and, and we're imagining too much? I don't think we're imagining too much. I think that, uh, you know, you probably heard of something called the Gartner hype cycle. Um, Gartner is an IT research firm in the United States, but I believe it has a global footprint. And so technologies come over the horizon, they're seen by futurists and they're hyped. And they, they may get funded by seed capitalists. And, um, and then they don't fulfill their initial um, expectations and then they fall out of favor and then while they're out of favor the real believers are continuing to beaver away on the problem using the you know harnessing Moore's law or Wong's law if you will you know applying better and better tools against this problem they're trying to solve AI is one of those I mean AI was first proposed in the 1950s I remember in the late 80s and early 90s here in Silicon Valley there was kind of a mini you know, a false dawn of AI. But it turned out that AI just needs extraordinary computational power and extraordinary bandwidth speeds and so on, which have suddenly arrived. And so I think the same, you know, 3D printing, I think the um, biological computing, uh, swallowing a computer, I mean, you know, I mean, that takes us back to science fiction in the 1960s. Will it happen eventually? But I think you have to think about all the, uh, and the, you know, the smartest investors think about what needs to happen for all of, for that, to pop out. And it turns out that a lot of underlying technologies have to reach a certain point. Um, I think we're in this exciting time today because, because cloud and edge and AI and big data and um, you know, all of those, uh, you know, perhaps blockchain, uh, perhaps some others, and, you know, and they're hitting genomics. And I mean, it just, it's the confluence and the support, the underlying supporting technology, I think that if you're trying to predict any timeline at all, you say, what, does it, what would have to happen with all the underlying technology? Where would it have to be at what price point for this thing that I'm going to invest in to happen? Well, I mean, I mean, uh, really, Rich, I would have gone on and on with you on conversations. You know, blockchain is a subject in itself. Other than cryptocurrency, I think blockchain has a huge role to play. Uh, crypto is just a small part of what it did. And, 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 and similarly, biotech and, and genomes and everything else. I mean, we can go on and on uh, on technology and the future. I really thank you for your time. Um, it was really a great presentation and something to be ready for uh, come 2021. Um, thanks once again for joining us and take care for now. Thank you, Mahavir. It's always a joy to, um, to hang around the Taikon people. Nothing but intelligence and energy and good.